So good morning and welcome back. Um, after the last uh, lecture, uh, some of you asked me about representations of Lie algebras and Lie groups. And um, I decided to have a brief section on this because indeed, mostly you meet al Lie algebras and Lie groups in physics uh, in terms of their representations. And very often they're even defined in terms of their representations. This is something we didn't do. We defined a Lie group as a smooth manifold with a group law that is compatible with the smooth structure. And we defined the Lie algebra uh, as the left invariant vector fields. And of course, we could pull all of this back to the uh, tangent space at the identity with a suitably induced bracket. But what on earth are these representations? So we should comment on that because it's very important. So we have a section 4.6, linear representations of Lie algebras and Lie groups. And we start with the algebras. And when the, then we briefly comment on the groups. Now again, uh, you can give a at least half semester long lecture on this topic. Uh, so I'll present mainly no proofs, but I'll introduce the uh, important concepts. So the key concept is the following definition. Let L with our abstract Lie bracket be a Lie algebra. Uh, then a representation of this Lie algebra is the following. It is a linear map which we may call rho, so let's say a representation rho of this algebra, uh, this Lie algebra is a linear map rho that goes from L, why can I say linear? Well, because L in particular is a vector space, goes into the endomorphisms of some vector space V. So this is some vector space V over the real or the complex numbers such that, okay, does that make sense? Well, if V is a vector space, let's say some finite dimensional vector space, and then we have a finite dimensional representation. Does that make sense? Well, L is a vector space, yeah. Uh, and V, well, that's a vector space because that's all the linear maps from V to V, which by themselves constitute a vector space again. Uh, such that, well, we need somehow compatibility with the Lie algebra bracket such that, well, I can first take the bracket of two Lie algebra elements, let's call them A and B, and then the result will be a Lie algebra element, and I map it, and I require that this be the same as first mapping one of them and mapping the other of them, and then the result being put into brackets. These are now, of course, not the differential geometric brackets because these are not vector fields. They're just uh, endomorphisms on V. And where this bracket is defined, so this is defined as, whenever we write this, now we mean this is an endomorphism, this is an endomorphism, so what I can certainly do, I can execute one after the other. I can compose them, and then I can again compose them, but in the opposite order, and that's of course what we know as a commutator. You take this and apply it to this, minus this, apply it to this. This is of course again an endomorphism, so this bracket here is a bracket, is a bilinear map from v and end v, end v to into end v. That is, uh, the bracket here goes from end v cross end v into end 
v. And of course, it's bilinear, you, it's easily checked. And in fact, by construction, it's anti-symmetric. And you can also check that it satisfies the Jacobi identity. Aha, that means why do I map into the endomorphisms? Well, because the endomorphisms, by virtue of having a natural composition on them, can be immediately made into a Lie algebra. Okay? So, and what I formulated here is that I say a representation of an abstract Lie algebra is a ma linear mapping into NV, which itself carries a Lie bracket namely this commutator bracket, and I require compatibility that I can first take the bracket and then map, or I can map the elements and then take the bracket, and should be the same outcome. Okay? And uh, so the <clears throat> this row is then called the representation, and uh, the vector space, the particular vector space that we used here, the particular vector space V that comes with a representation is called the representation space. The representation space. Okay, so that is uh, maybe confusing because one might have thought, well, you map the Lie algebra to end V, so you might say NV is the representation space where you represent the L. Well, that is what it is, but the terminology says this V is the representation space, okay? And the idea behind it is that once you have a row of some Lie algebra elements, some row of A, you can act on the representation space V because row of A, of a little a, is an endomorphism in V, so an endomorphism can act on a vector and produce a new vector. That's the idea. Okay, so that's the abstract definition of a linear representation. So we should call this then a linear representation because we do this by endomorphisms on a vector space. Okay, so example or examples. Well, uh, so we discussed at great length, the SL2C Lie algebra, and we found that it has three generators, well, three basis vectors. Uh, this is three-dimensional algebra, and we wrote down these commutation relations for it. This was 2x2, this is x1, x3, this minus 2x3, and this is x2, x3 is x1. And we derived this from the left invariant vector fields, and the structure was inherited, after all, from the product structure on the Lie group, capital S, L, 2, C. But this is a Lie algebra. And now these three vector fields, we, we only, or these three vectors, we had only the interpretation these are the representatives of the left invariant vector fields at the identity. We didn't know more. Now, a representation, a representation, because there are, in general, there are many, many representations, a representation of SL2C is provided by, um, aha, um, so let's call it rho, and it takes the first Lie algebra basis vector, Aha, because it's a linear map, it suffices to prescribe it on a basis, right? So I prescribe it on a basis. I say this one is 1 minus 1, 0, 0. Uh, on the second one, it's uh, 0, 1, 0, 0. And rho on the third one is 0, 0, 1, 0. So what I'm obviously doing here, I'm providing a representation SL2C which chooses as its representation space, let's say, C2. And obviously, I can give elements in C2 with respect to a canonical basis, because this is C cross C I'm acting on. Uh, I can represent linear maps, endomorphisms, by their representing matrices, and I choose these. 
Now, this is a linear map, all right, well, by linear extension, of course, continuation. But now check whether this satisfies this compatibility condition. Well, we can calculate what is rho of x1 commutator rho of x2, for instance. So let's take these two guys. I have to take the commutator. Uh, and that's, of course, the composition here in the abstract uh, represent in the abstract writing, of course, corresponds to matrix multiplication once I take these um, uh, basis representations. And so I have to calculate 1, 0, 0, minus 1 on 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 0, 1, 0, 0 on 1, 0, 0, minus 1 using uh, the infamous matrix multiplication. And that yields. 0, there's a 1 here, uh, 0 here, and 0 here, minus, OK, what does this yield? 0 here, minus 1 here, 0, 0. So this is equal to 2 times 0, 1, 0, 0. But 2 times 0, 1, 0, 0 is 2 times rho of x2, right? And uh, aha, 2 times rho of x2. Uh, but uh, this x2, so this is, of course, because rho is linear. This is rho times 2x2, because of the linearity of rho. Um, but that is rho of the commutator of x1 with x2, because x1 with x2 is 2x2. And uh, so we see that for the pair x1, x2, uh, this relation here, this compatibility condition, is satisfied. Why? So now I al also check this for uh, 1 and 3 and 2 and 3. And if for all of these it's valid, it's already valid for any elements of the Lie algebra because the bracket is bilinear, so I only need to check this on a basis. OK? So yeah, that's right. This is a representation of SL2C, this kind of matrix representation. Okay, and that is how it's usually given. And then you can ask, well, if that is so, so what is rho of SL2C? So the entire image, so that lies in n in n c squared. Okay, but if you now think about the the rho of all of this is of course the uh, the vector space generated by these three. And that's, of course, the vector space of matrices um, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, where alpha plus delta equals 0. Or more abstractly written, uh, it's the space of all endomorphisms here uh, that have trace 0. They're the trace-free matrices. And that's what usually sa it's usually said. It says SL2C, the group, is the matrices of determinant 1, and the corresponding algebra is the 2 by 2 matrices of, that are trace free. But in fact, this is just a statement on the representations of the group and the algebra. Didn't tell you what a group present, present, um, representation is. We'll come to that later. Uh, but usually, one defines the algebra this way. But we didn't, because we come from the group. We went the abstract way. And this is just one representation. And the whole business about representations is that for any given Lie algebra, well, certain conditions apply, you have several representations. There's not one representation. And this is just a representation here. OK. Now. A representation that, of course, appears in physics very often, or an algebra that appears in physics very often, is, um, is the rotation algebra. So this was the first example, A. And uh, let's have an example, B. You can have L, B, S, O, 3, R, so the uh, rotations, well, that's the idea. That's the Lie algebra that comes from the rotation group uh, here. And, um, well, should I take this? Or I, yeah, I take this one. 
And um, it's defined like any Lie algebra. I can define it by saying there is some basis. Uh, it's a three-dimensional Lie algebra. So SO3, R happens to be three-dimensional. And so it has a basis, and I and J run from one to three. And the statement is there is a basis uh, where the structure coefficients, which I always have, so I always have these guys, and now I need to determine these guys, and I do this as follows. First, um, I um, uh, define the killing form. Killing form. Uh, that's uh, K A B is C A C B M N N M. We had this before. And then uh, using the killing form, I pull down this index. I define uh, C down K I J. What is this? I don't know because I only know what C, K, C up K I J is. Well, I define it to be C K um, C K M C M I J. So one could say I pull the index, but well, that's just a way of saying this. So you can do this also um, coordinate free. But anyway, let's do it like this or basis free. Uh, so this is then this guy, and the SO31 is now defined by uh, SO, uh, th not 31, uh, 3R is defined by having these Cs with the indices down Kij to be epsilon Ijk. Uh, well, what that means is that um, is 1 if Ij k is an even permutation of 1, 2, 3. It's minus 1 if this is an odd permutation of 1, 2, 3. And it's 0 else if it's no permutation at all, for instance, 1, 1, 2. So if you have these totally anti-symmetric structure coefficients, but in order to be able to say they're totally anti-symmetric, you need to have the killing form to pull this down. Okay, and of course you can reconstruct this and you can think if you have this, how do you get back this guy? And so you construct this from this epsilon. Okay, so um, that's SO3R. So the question is, uh, are we able to uh, actually find a representation for SO3R? And again, a representation uh, is given by rho taking SO3, R linearly into the endomorphisms over R3. That is what you learn in elementary school, that the rotation algebra can act. The three-dimensional rotation algebra can act on R3. Uh, and in fact, you do something like rho of x1 is 1 minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, rho of x2 is, so now it could be that uh, I start being inconsistent in my choice of signs. I think there the sign choice is the other way around. So here it's plus minus and here it's minus plus, but I'm not entirely sure. You should uh, check uh, for yourself, but uh, up to signs, this is right. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, let's say it's here again like this. And uh, please check whether it's right with the signs. And you can start checking whether, again, this compatibility condition that the Lie bracket is respected in the above sense is satisfied. So this is also a representation of SO3R. But as you famously know from quantum mechanics, there is another representation, right? So another representation of so 3 comma r uh, is rho, let's call it rho spin. And what does that do? Well, it takes elements of SO3 comma r and it maps them linearly to the endomorphisms over C squared. So it acts on two component complex objects, right? Two complex component objects. Um, and there it's something like rho spin takes, again, the first uh, basis element, if the basis is given such that this, these are the, uh, the algebra relations. 
And um, so now there is an issue of whether you get there an I or you don't get an I. So it's something like uh, one half sigma one matrix, one half the sigma two matrix, and one half the sigma three matrix. Uh, and don't kill me if you need an overall I. Uh, please figure this out for yourself as well. Uh, so and again, the uh, sigma matrices, they also commute like this, maybe plus or minus, including a factor of I or not. Uh, and that's another representation of the rotation algebra. So you, uh, yeah, so you have the rotation algebra, so that's the algebra of the rotation group in three dimensions. And um, you can represent this on R3. You, know, you can rotate stuff in, in, um, in three space, in real three space. Or you can represent the same algebra on C2. And these are, of course, the spinners you'd use in Schrodinger theory, right? And um, yeah, so. They're transformed under the same symmetry algebra or algebra. Okay, so these are different representations. Okay, so here I gave you a second one. Maybe it's worth giving a third example. Well, it's definitely worth giving a third example. And the fourth one. So the, the third example. So this one I gave because we know all the background, the SL2C one. The SO3 one I gave because you know it from physics anyway. Um, there's another one you know anyway, uh, and that is um, uh, there is always there is always the trivial the trivial representation um, on any vector space as the representation space. Although, yeah. So, um, so if you have a Lie algebra, you can always give rho trivial that takes the algebra linearly in the endomorphisms over some vector space, but every element A is simply being mapped to the zero map on these endomorphisms, so on the matrix with only zeros, if you, if you wish. Um, and uh, this is, of course, a representation because a row of A, a row of the commutator of A and B, not the commutator, a row of the Lie bracket, where whatever it is, it will be sent to zero. And a row of A, row of B with the commutator on the endomorphisms, well, if each of these is zero, then this will, be, of course, be 0. And, um, uh, and that's the same 0, because this is the 0 in the endomorphisms. And this is also the 0 in the endomorphisms. So that's always the same. So compatibility is always there. And physicists call this the scalar representation. Scalar here in the sense that um, Nothing changes under, well, because the algebra. We come to that later. Anyway, that's the trivial representation. And um, there is another representation we used all the time in the last, during the last few lectures, but uh, we never called it a representation. And it answered the question, so every Lie algebra has a trivial representation. Question, uh, does every Lie algebra, question, does every Lie algebra have a non-trivial representation, have a non-trivial representation. And I also introduced the notion of a faithful representation in a second. And the answer is yes. What you can do, you take a row and you call this the adjoint representation. There's the following, that's the representation that takes the Lie algebra and linearly maps it into an endomorph endomorphism space. And you already got the heck of it. What uh, is one choice you make for a representation is the choice on which space, what the representation spaces you choose. Um, the other choice, once you have chosen a representation space, there may still be different linear maps, right? And these are then representations on the same representation space, but they could still be different maps. It's clear, if you chose the target, you haven't chosen the whole thing yet. OK, but anyway, so one choice is choosing a representation space, and you want to represent a linear 
algebra. Now imagine you're, you're very short of examples for vector spaces where one vector space already gave you, namely the vector space underlying the Lie algebra. So it's an interesting question to ask, is it possible to represent the Lie algebra on the representation space that's given by the Lie algebra itself? So you no problem. I, I, I think. Okay, so we choose this as the representation space. And the question is, how do we construct a Lie algebra there? And I already showed you how. Namely, you take an element here and you map it to a comma, well, this Lie bracket, A comma open slot. What does that mean? Well, uh, this guy we called add of A. So the add map we had all the time does nothing but it takes an element from the Lie algebra and sends it to a linear map from the Lie algebra to the Lie algebra. Because this guy, if I feed it an element L of the Lie algebra, it sends this to A comma L, which is again an element of the Lie algebra. So add A is an endomorphism on L, right? So it's the adjoint representation. Yes, the adjoint representation, OK? And you see that our classification of semi-simple and finally simple Lie algebras made essential use of the adjoint representation because we took these guys, add, and we on the Cartan subalgebra, we said all the others are um, uh, uh, eigenvectors and so on. Okay. So this is the adjoint representation. So now, uh, if we want to study representations, again, we want to study building blocks. So if we have a representation that can be understood by understanding two other representations, we don't need to bother about this uh, representation. We can understand in, understand in terms of others. And so the key definition is a representation, representation rho of L into some and V of a Lie algebra um, is called reducible. So it can be put into, can be decomposed into pieces. It's called reducible if there exists a vector subspace of the representation space. So let's call it U, a vector subspace U of the representation space um, such that um, applying rho for any Lie algebra element A to an element U of that subspace, so such that for all A in A in L and for all U only in the subspace, the result of this action again lies only in that subspace. So in other words, you can restrict this map. So in other words, in other words, uh, the map, the representation map row restricts, restricts to row sub u, which is a map from only, from, from in all of L only into end of u. Yeah, that's right, only into end of u, and this is still a linear map, okay? And uh, the point is, if such a non-trivial, it exists a sub-vector space that's non-zero, it's not the zero vector space, because that, for that one, it of course, always works, uh, then we call the representation reducible. And um, otherwise, the representation is called irreducible, otherwise rho taking L into NV 
is called irreducible. So uh, let me provide an example for that. So we saw we had the uh, row that took SO3, R into the endomorphisms over R3 with the row of X1, X2, and X3 being defined as I did. Okay? And we also had the representation row spin. Well, we could call this row vector. Right? And we call this row spin that takes the same Lie algebra into endomorphisms on C2. So that can act then, the results can act on uh, spinners in Schrodinger theory, say. Now, of course, we could construct, we could construct a representation um, that we now call rows. So this were row vec and row spin. And we could construct a row that is SO3, R, and that sends it to the endomorphisms. OK, I hope I didn't get into trouble here with the endomorphisms. Yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, into the endomorphisms over uh, R3 plus C2. OK. So um, the idea is that now I say a row of still just some element from here is being mapped to, now I give you the representing matrix of this guy, uh, is being mapped to a row vec of A, that's a three by three real matrix, uh, and here I go to row spin of A, and that's a two by two complex matrix, whatever, the whole thing can be considered as a complex matrix, and there are zeros here. I can definitely do that. And if you now ask about the commutation behavior of these of two objects of this form, it's clear the matrix multiplication can be executed blockwise, right? That means by if I start commutating these guys, this guy will only see the relevant block in the other row of B, and this guy will only see the relevant block in the, in the row of B. And of course, this is again representation. If this is a representation, this is a representation, and I have this of this block form, uh, then it can immediately be checked that rho is again a representation. OK? But now, but rho, um, but u equals uh, R3, namely this part of R3, and uh, U prime equal C squared, namely this part, and the others being set to zero. Um, so I should write here uh, plus, uh, plus nothing. Well, you, you know what I mean by this. Um, our subspaces, our vector subspaces of this vector space, okay? The vector subspaces, and indeed, if I act only on a vector, you have to think about you act. Well, so think about this thing acts on a vector that has only entries up here and two zeros here. That's of course an element in this subspace. If you act on this again blockwise, the result will again lie in here. There will from these three stars there will nothing put here because of this block structure. So this. R3 here, the subspace, is uh, what you call an invariant subspace. Well, I didn't call it like this. There exists a vector subspace U called an invariant subspace. Such an action on there produces a result still in there. And the same here. So we see immediately, if it has this block form, uh, then the representation is reducible. Okay? And um, one can also show that these two representations are not reducible. And I can always, if I have a reducible representation, I can always understand it. This is just an example. I can always understand it by the building blocks, which are reducible representations. And then, of course, I only use these building blocks. Now, in particle physics, people say particles are irreducible representations of the underlying symmetry group. So let's say you take a particle. Well, the symmetry group of classical mechanics is the Galilei group. So you have to bother not only about rotations, but also about Galilei boosts, and also about translations in, in, in space-time. Well, that's the, the yeah, OK, fine. Uh, but 
that's a little complicated. Let's take the symmetry group of a particle that I trap at some point. So I trap a particle in, in a certain place, but then the particle, there's still rotational invariance, right? You cannot move them, but it's still rotational invariance. And um, so that would be a particle that has a, 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 an SO3 group, capital SO3 rotation group invariance. This is the corresponding algebra. And if you say particles are representations of that group, you can see if you trap a particle um, then one representation is to represent it by a vector, the other one is by a scalar, but one representation is to represent it by a two-component spinner. And that's, of course, what you do in quantum mechanics. But you could now, if you said, you said a particle is an irreducible representation of the symmetry algebra in this case, um, if you took a reducible one, you could always make two particles out of it. Okay, so two particles also transform according to the symmetry and some representation, uh, but you want to understand that an elementary particle is only an, an irreducible representation. Okay, you can understand, you can study the elementary particle on its own. You don't, if, if you always have to study a particle together with another particle, well, then neither of them is elementary, then the whole thing is maybe elementary, right? So that's the, uh, well, I'm, I'm just, um, talking about why this term irreducible representation comes up in particle physics. You want to understand the elementary building blocks in physics you call that elementary particle. Okay. Um, question to reducibility, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a, a non, well, proper a uh, non-trivial I should have written, non-trivial, and you're right, it's not, it doesn't suffice to exclude uh, the zero, it, uh, you need to exclude the entire space too because otherwise, yeah, that's right, thank you, that's right. Okay, good. There's yet another definition uh, one uses quite frequently and that is um, a representation row L into N over some representation space V um, is called faithful if rho is injective. So one Lie algebra element under the map rho doesn't hit a uh, the same endomorphism twice, okay? Yeah. yeah, that's right, doesn't hit the same endomorphism. No, any, no, what did I say? So, you know that injective means that if you have equal images, you had equal, so no two here, hit the same there. That's it. No two here hit the same here under the map rho. So it's the lover's map and then you understand faithful. It's injective. Okay. So, um, so you could check whether the adjoint representation, for instance, is injective. And you could check whether the adjoint representation is irreducible. Okay. Well, let's formulate this as a homework problem. So let's say problem sheet. Uh, check irreducibility and faithfulness. of rho equals add the adjoint representation. Now, there is a very important concept in the study of representations and that's the concept of a so-called Casimir operator. And because in physics, very often, you are handed the Lie algebra already in a representation, there's sometimes some confusion 
that you can construct a Casimir operator for a given Lie algebra, but that's not true. The Casimir operator can be constructed for a given representation of a given Lie algebra. The Casimir operator can be constructed for any given representation of any given Lie algebra. Okay, uh, how can we do this? Well, this proceeds in several steps. So I all subsume this all, all under the definition of Casimir operator, but fine. So the first thing we can do, of course, if we have a representation rho of our Lie algebra on some representation space, uh, we can define the uh, killing form, killing form um, on end v with the commutator bracket. Because after all, end v equipped with the commutator bracket is a Lie algebra. So I can definitely define the killing form on there. And that would be the killing form. And I put k down rho, because it has to do with a particular representation, um, uh, k down rho of, um, OK, how do you call this up over here, uh, the endomorphisms. I don't know, call them phi and psi, OK? Is defined as, as usual. Ah, hang on a second. No, I want to do this differently. Um, no, I want to do this differently. I'm sorry. So it's obvious you can define the killing form on NV uh, with the bracket, because that's a Lie algebra. Uh, but I want to do something different. Um, I want to define a new killing form on L. But now uh, it's the row killing form, and I call it k row. It takes two elements of L, and it still sends them to, well, say, the complex numbers in case of a complex um, Lie algebra. And, but now it's defined as. Uh, k rho takes an a and a b in the Lie algebra and sends them to the trace of, and now it comes, of rho of a circ rho of b. And you see that for that the killing form we defined so far, so uh, hence the killing form we had so far was the killing form with respect to the adjoint representation. So as we previously defined it, because there we put here add A circ add B. Okay? But you can, of course, define this k rho for any representation. Okay? So, well, that's, that's the first thing that has nothing to do with the, well, it has to do with the Casimir operator, but. Um, So you have that. Now you define the Casimir operator. So that's step B. You define the Casimir operator, let's call it omega, with respect to the given representation as well, what is it? It's uh, a map from V to V. So it's an element in end V. And uh, it's defined as omega rho. Um, hold on a second. Yes, omega rho is defined as the sum i equals 1 to the dimension of the Lie algebra. And you take the row of xi. xi is a basis. I'll write this down in a second of the Lie algebra. After row of um, xi i. What on earth is xi i? Well, 
because it's eaten by the rho, this must be in the Lie algebra, and this must be in the Lie algebra too, where x1 to x dim L is any basis, it doesn't matter which one, is any basis of L, okay? And psi 1 to psi dim L is the other basis of L for which we use our newly defined k rho killing form, k rho for which k rho of xi comma xi j, you see it eats another set of vectors on L, uh, is delta ij, uh, which with two indices down looks funny, but it's one for i equals j and zero else. Okay. So the idea here is what I could also do, I could use xi's here, and I could again use the xi's, but then I need to also normalize the basis of the, of the um, Lie algebra with respect to the killing form. Okay? And as it's written down here, um, I could only find an orthonormal basis um, if the Lie group I come from is compact, and then I probably have to put a minus here, minus one or something. Um, yeah. Let me think for a second. Yeah, so this, actually this only works if the Lie group is compact, because otherwise I don't find such a basis. Okay, so for compact groups it works like this. Now, okay, you have this, and this here is the so-called Casimir operator, and obviously can, you can feed it a vector in the representation space, and it munches it through, it kicks out a vector in the representation space, and uh, we have the theorem, and I asked you to prove that on the problem sheet, um, that if you take the rho omega rho, this is an element of NV as we just saw, and you take any other, the rho of any other Lie algebra element A, so that the whole thing is again in NV, then you can, of course, calculate the commutator of these two, and you will always get zero. So uh, the motto here is that the Casimir operator commutes with uh, everything. Well, everything, everything meaning every image with the whole row of L. So everything is row of L, okay? And this is how it's often, often introduced, okay? So um, now about objects like this, um, there is something called Schur's lemma, okay? And that states in this particular context that if rho is irreducible, if rho is irreducible, but that we can always do because we can always study the irreducible parts of a representation. If rho is irreducible, then the omega rho is always equal to some number c that depends on rho. So this is just an element, this is just a number. Well, I say it's an element of C, or it could also be an element of R. It, it, it depends on over what vector space you are. Times the identity on the representation space. Or if you would express it in terms of a matrix, it would be a diagonal matrix with C rho, C rho, C rho, C rho, C rho on the diagonal. That's true lemma. Uh, but this only ha is true if rho is irreducible. Okay, so the Casimir operator of an irreducible representation 
is actually um, a constant multiple of the identity on the representation space. Now, uh, let us try to show, let's try to show uh, the following claim. That this number C rho is always given in the irreducible case by the dimension of the Lie algebra divided by the dimension of the, uh, of the representation space. Okay, so if you ask what's, yeah. okay, let, let's, let's, let's try to show this, so proof. Uh, let's see how, how this can be done. Um. Aha. Right, so if uh, rho irreducible, It follows that omega rho is C rho times the identity on V. And that means that the trace of omega rho, omega rho is an endomorphism on V, so I can take the trace, uh, is the trace of C rho times it V. But the trace is R linear, so this is C rho or C linear times the trace of it V. And what is the trace of the identity map on the vector space? I hear? The dimension, the dimension of the vector space. That's right. It's C rho times dim V. Aha. So this dim V, we apparently get somehow from here. OK, that looks good because we have a C rho times dim V. We could take this here. So what we have to show that the trace of omega rho has something to do with the dimension of L here, I guess. OK, so let's write down what that is. So the trace of omega rho is the trace of what was omega rho was the sum from I equals 1 to the dimension of L. Aha, starts looking good. Um, rho of xi after rho of xi i. Okay? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So now let's pull out the sum dim l and we just have the trace of rho of xi after rho of xi i. Um, but this is nothing but our killing form k rho with respect to the rho map of xi comma xi i. Do you agree? But the xi i's were chosen exactly such that this is delta, that this is always 1, right? For every i, this is 1, because i i is a delta i j is a 1. So we have the sum over i equals 1 to dim l over 1, and that very nicely is dim l. So dim l is c rho times dim v, so c rho is dim l by dim v. Okay, good. So um, that comes out. And what does it mean? Well, it means that if I have different representation spaces for the same two representation spaces, V1 and V2, for the same Lie algebra, they are labeled by this factor C rho uh, that defines for irreducible representation defines the Casimir operator. Okay, so in other words, I can act with the Casimir operator on any element in the vector space V 
of this one particular representation space and I'll get the same number. Okay? And, um, well, if you do this in, uh, in physics, you know that if you act with, so example, but now we've got to be careful because in, in physics we're uh, choosing different factors here, but uh, the example in spirit is you have ji, jj equals epsilon i, j, k, j, k, okay, something of that type. Um, so this just being considered numerically uh, is the, are the um, commutation relations, so abstract V algebra. So this is the SO3R rotation group. And um, then you can, of course, take this row spin, okay, take row spin, and um, take it of any of the J's. Well, it doesn't matter, the i-th one. And um, you, so J1, J2, J3. And then you can define what usually in physics you call j vector squared. But it's not j vector squared. It's um, the row of the j i squared. So you take row of j i times row of j i, and you sum i equals 1, 2, 3. And you see, now in principle, if you do this, then you claim these are the x's, and these are the, the j's, uh, the, the xi's as well. Well, you've got to be careful that uh, you have the right uh, normalization here, and I think you don't. I think you, you need a factor one half or something in front. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm not entirely sure. Something like this, okay. And this you call the, the rho omega rho, yeah, the omega rho. And now if you choose here, you can take omega rho vector, uh, and then you can take the sum, say it's one half, and then you take this times this, so you take the square of every individual one. So how is that? That's the one minus one, zero, 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 zero squared, now it's this composition with itself, goes into matrix multiplication, plus the square, square, squared. Now these three, what does it give? It's one half. Um, and it yields 1, 1, 0 for this first one. You agree? And for the second one we define, it yields 1, 0, 1. And for the third j we define in the vector representation, it yields 0, 1, 1. Agree? Because there are always these 1 minus 1 blocks and everything else is 0. You get this. So what do you have? You have 1 half times 2, 2, 2 equals 1, 1, 1. Uh, okay, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And this is a particular example. So the C rho vector times 1, 1, 1, uh, the number for the vector representation C is 1. Agree? So I should have written this 1 half here. So these are the size, okay? So you go here, and the rho vec we just calculated for a particular representation. We calculated this Casimir operator and gives the C rho vec times the identity. That means, so from here we learn, C rho in the vector representation is one. Does this work with our theorem? Ah, oh, yeah, the three-dimensional rotation algebra divided by the dimension of the vector representation, the representation space is R3, is 3 divided by 3 is 1. Aha, wonderful. So again, usually in, in, in physics, we don't have the factor one half, and then everything is wrong by a factor one half. But I need to make sure that this is the, if you want dual other basis uh, with respect to the killing form, once you've chosen this basis, yeah? Oh, yeah. Where? This one. So we, we believe that without the square, this is rho of j1 in the vector representation. And now I take the, oh, I see. 
Okay, yeah, because this is an I. This is like a complex I, this block, and it's a minus sign. Aha. But didn't I always say that I have a, also say I have a problem with the minus sign over there, where I said uh, it only works for compact groups, but if I want to have it work for compact groups, I know that the k rho uh, of the xi uh, xi j, I want to have to be delta ij for compact uh, groups. Um, I can only achieve, uh, for compact groups, the killing form would be negative definite, so I should have a minus sign here. Um, so that means I should have an overall minus sign here in the definition, uh, and then the signs are right. Okay, so I, I apologize for, for the signs, but it's uh, excellent that you see this. Okay, thank you. All right, but so uh, now let's not miss out, but I need your help with the sigma matrices. Let's not miss out on the next example, which is again the abstract rotation group, uh, epsilon i, j, k, j, k. Um, but now we take not the vector representation. So I here wrote rho spin. Well, I have rho spin and I have rho vec. And then we evaluated it for rho vec. Um, now for rho spin, we said the ith one is represented by the ith sigma ma matrix one half. Um, and you, can, can you remind me of the sigma matrices? This is embarrassing, but... Uh, Sigma matrices? O one one O. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's very quickly check sigma one with sigma two. How that works? Zero one one zero times. I, I'm after a factor here, so I need to check this minus i i zero. Um, that yields uh, i, 0, 0, minus i. And so this is um, i times sigma 3. Aha, exactly. And now the opposite is 0 minus i, i 0 on 0, 1, 1, 0 equals minus i, 0, 0, i, and that is minus i sigma 3. So that means the commutator, and that's really the commutator, of sigma 1 with sigma 2 yields 2 times i sigma 3, because this minus goes by the minus from, from this bracket. And um, so the sigma 3 is good because 1, 2, 3, there's a 1 but I have a, a factor of 2i that I don't like. So therefore, I take sigma half matrices that gives me an overall factor of 1 fourth, right, compared to what I had, but this is of, overall factor of 1 half, so that's sigma 3 half. So if instead of sigma matrices, I take sigma half matrices, I, I have the unit factor, and that's why I chose the half here. But there's a remaining problem, that is, I have an i here. So that means, however, I can do a similar trick. And I can then choose um, i times sigma i half. So I put an i here and an i here. Uh, the problem is that gives me a minus sign here. I don't want that either. Uh, but if I choose a minus i, I have a minus i here and a minus i there, then the minus sign goes because of the two minus signs. Oh. Oh, well, that's not so nice. No, it stays because of the two minus signs. Well, well you, you should complain. I have a minus sign before, and I have two minus signs on the left, and then nothing changes. Minus times minus times minus is minus. That means if I choose this, thing, so I take this as a block, and this as a block, comma, and this as a block, so I define the representation like this, then I get precisely this commutation relation. Okay, so this is how, how you do that. And in quantum mechanics, we often decide that we want uh, this to be Hermitian or something, and then, then uh, we, we put an extra i here, okay? 
uh, but, but we can always arrange for this. So I, I chose this, the so rotation algebra, so we'll stick to this. This would be the spin representation. And now we calculate the Casimir operator of the spin representation. So this again works precisely like this. So we said the Casimir operator here uh, is minus uh, one half sum i equals one to three of rho xi after rho xi. Again, this one half actually belongs into here by linearity that works uh, because um, uh, because we need to have the size. Okay, fine. So, but now that's again the general formula. <coughs> now I have rho of the spin representation is minus one half. Um, so this sum, what is the sum? Well, we have to take the representing matrices. So we have this one times minus i. We have minus i minus i zero zero squared. Uh, that's right, no? And we have plus, it's this plus from the sum. We have uh, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. No. OK, I mean, anyway, the overall, I, we have minus i times minus i is minus 1. It's, it's like this, where it doesn't matter because there's a square. And the final one is uh, minus i, i, minus i, i on the diagonal squared that we have to evaluate is minus one half times. Uh -huh. uh, okay, what is this? This is uh, minus i squared is minus one minus one. Agree? Trippy. Uh, plus, now this guy squared is this times this is minus one. Uh, hang on. This, this times this is minus one. And then I have uh, this, this times this, this is again minus one. Is that right? Yeah. And then I again have over here this squared is minus one minus one. Ah, exactly. So this is in total. The minuses all go out and cancel this one, and then there is a three everywhere. So it's three half of the identity. Agree? I think that's right. It's three half, okay? And hence, the C row spin is three half, or as we like to write it, one half times one half plus one. Does it work? Well, of course it works, because the algebra has still dimension three, and the representation space is now two dimensional, so it's three half. It's, of course, the J times J plus one, okay? No? Ah, this is, uh, okay, hang on. So some, some, uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. What's wrong with our factors? So here the factor was right. Ah, of course, I took the sigma matrices and I should have taken the sigma half matrices, but that gives me a factor of a fourth now. Okay, so I should have taken the sigma half matrices, but that says I have an overall factor by four. That doesn't make it much better because now I have again a factor one half wrong. Oh dear. Ah. Ah, J plus J plus, uh huh. Aha, uh -huh. so obviously, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, look, look, we, we have a mismatch between the physics and the mathematics definition. Because if this, if this was the spin one, the vector representation, the number should be two. J times J plus one, J equals one being a vector would be one times two, one plus one is two. But I, I have this here. So there is a difference between the physics and the mathematics definition. So I claim this result is three, well, it is three-eighths. I, I cannot change it. This is three-eighths. Uh, and it is not j times j plus one, because in the vector case, it wasn't either. There is an overall factor of, so in the vector representation, uh, the, physics j, the, the physics result I have here is a factor of two of this. And here also, the physics result is a factor of two of this, namely three quarters. 
j times one half times one half plus one. So this is just a mismatch. So uh, you'd say in physics, okay, let's uh, have this here as an explanation. And I think it's really true. I mean, this is not just, uh, okay, I think it's really true. So the point is that the Casimir operator in physics, physics is defined as twice the Casimir operator we defined here. There's an overall factor of two. Yeah, and we know this because in physics we take the j squared. Don't you see this? In physics you take the one half over here, so you, times two, and you say it's the j vector squared, meaning the representation of this guy squared, there is no factor one half that goes here. So this is the right mathematics result because you want to have the dual base, well, the, the xi dual bases on the same space with respect to the killing form in order to make the whole thing basis independent. And how we define it in physics, if I... Re, uh, uh, um, if I changed basis, I would get a different uh, Casimir operator, which is not good. So that's actually the, the, the better definition here, but uh, it, it relates to this like that. Yeah? What about, what's the well, this is C2. This is, um, uh, we treat this all as uh, complex dimensional representation spaces. Also, this one could have acted on, on C3. Okay, so I need to take a step back and look from your perspective. That seems to work better. So... Interesting. Interesting. I don't know. Um, yeah? No, but the factor is 3 eighths, isn't it? So it's the one half from this definition, and then I take the minus i sigma i tralalala matrices, and I square, and then I have the, the one half factor becomes a one fourth from the squaring. This one half is there by definition. Here I always get something of the type minus one is, is three, it's minus three up here. I mean, yeah, if it was a three over four, I'd say, yeah, it's the complex thing counted up. I'm, 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 I'm a little confused, I must admit. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't get the algebra straight. Unless you, you see it now, uh, I, I need to think about it. No, we, we, we need it here. Yeah, but do we need it here as well? I know what you need it here because if you... Yes, because this has to do with... Be ah. Ah, okay. So you say we chose the basis. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. You absolutely think that, that sounds absolutely right. So we said that in the definition of the omega rho... Um, which is the sum of i equals 1 to dim L uh, of uh, rho of xi after rho of xi i. Aha, very good, Benedict. Thank you very much. Um, we said that the k, that this guy, these guys here are such that xi with xi j is minus delta ij. That was the correction because of the compact Lie group. And, um, but of course, that depends on this row. That depends on this row because this is the trace of row of xi after row of xi j. Aha, 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 aha. Okay, the plot thickens. So if you then 
use these guys in the spin representation, of course, because of this business here and using these matrices and so on, you of course get a different factor by which the Xi J's, well, if they're anyway uh, uh, collinear to the Xi's, the Xi I's, but then you get a different factor here that you need to use in order to make this work. It's an excellent problem sheet question. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, but uh, thank you, Benji. It's an excellent observation. Uh, it's not always the same way you construct the xi i's if this is the xi. Uh, I, I was deluded by saying, well, it has just to do with the Lie algebra elements. Yeah, but it's with respect to the k row, to the killing form with respect to the representation. Then you have to adapt this. So this factor here is in question. And it's now entirely clear to all of us that this factor uh, here is, uh, well, so I have a fourth here. This one half goes, this one half goes, there's a three. Um, so uh, this one half goes, so it's a three fourth, but it must be three two. Uh, so it's everybody agrees uh, that it's very likely a, a factor of two that you have here so that you get three over two. OK, but now uh, I should make no further guesses here. Uh, just calculate. But that's, that's the, the, the origin of the trouble. OK? Good. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, so you see that different representation spaces, at least if they differ in their dimension, are labeled by different uh, numbers in front of the Casimir operator. All right. Good. Um, And hence, we say a particle has spin, spin 1 half, or a particle has spin 1. You can act on any representing vector, uh, and, 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 and it, it yields the same value for the Casimir operator. So I still maintain that this factor of 2 between mathematics and physics still remains. Uh, but the other comment is, of course, important as well to, to clarify the mismatch in case of the spin Casimir operator. Now, um, let's talk about representations of a Lie group. So now turn to Lie groups. Definition. Um, let G with a blob be a finite dimensional Lie group, then a representation of the Lie group is a map. Now let's call it capital R. And it takes a group element, not an algebra element, it takes a group element. And it maps it to, well, not the endomorphisms, but almost to GL over some vector space. So again, the V is some vector space. OK, so very similar idea. But the GL is, of course, not the end V. It's a little less. What is GLV? Well, we had it in a special case over c to the n or r to the n. GLV is the set of all linear maps phi from v to v. So I should say phi in the endomorphisms. Okay, But there's an additional condition. And the condition is that the determinant of phi be non-zero. Or in other words, then the endomorphism is invertible, that it be invertible. Okay, so. There's this restriction. And um, so this is a map so, huh? uh, such that, so before I write this warning sign, uh, such that um, if you represent a group element G1 as a general linear map on V, as an invertible, so as an isomorphism on V, 
and then you use the composition on GLV because obviously GLV has a composition and the composition of invertible maps is again invertible so the circ is closed over GLV fine so you can do RG1 after RG2 and you again land in GLV and you already guess it you require compatibility with the group law by saying you could have also first blobbed the two group elements with respect to the Lie group operation and only then have it mapped over here. That means nothing different but that the circ on GLV mimics what the blob does on the group and of course the, the way the, the map acts here um, um, uh, is important. So that's a representation of the Lie group so it looks very similar. Okay. Now, uh, examples uh, are in order. So now take as the Lie group, you take uh, S O 2. Okay, S O 2. And um, well, you have to, to use a chart and so on because the manifold S O 2 as a manifold. Uh, so as a differentiable manifold, this is S1. So the circle is the manifold that underlies the SO operation. And of course, the multiplication on SO2 is moving vectors, uh, uh, well, moving points along the circle. Okay, we, we, we know all of this. And um, uh, you can choose a chart where... Um, S1, well, a chart U that lies in S1 that goes to, uh, well, let's call this the, uh, the angle map that goes to um, the angle of U lying in R. So it's a one-dimensional manifold. And um, the angle, well, let's not be childish. So this is called the phi. Phi is called the angle. And um, you know that if you have S1, uh, you have to take out some point, okay, and then you can, uh, well, let's say, take out this one, and then you can, in a sense, intuitively take this angle, but you cannot cover all of it because then here you, you wouldn't be open. Anyway, you can do this, and then you can represent, you have a representation, well, not on the entire group because you choose coordinates to write it down, but on this U, uh, you have a representation. Uh, into, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm confused. Ah, oh, yeah, you have a representation into G L R squared. So you have a representation space R squared. And it works like that um, for the uh, group element that corresponds to this coordinate phi. So you take, aha. Uh -huh. So I should have called this anyway, the angle, the angle map. And uh, so then you take the uh, angle map inverse of phi, okay? And that's then obviously an element in the group. And uh, to this element in the group, you associate the matrix. Well, you can represent this by a matrix. Cos phi, sine phi, minus sine phi, cos phi, okay? Um, and you can check that first adding angles here is of course the same as doing compositions there at the end of the day because of the uh, laws, the, the addition theorems for cosine and, uh, uh, and sine. So I claim, um, so this is the R, so I claim that R of the angle inverse of phi 1 plus phi 2 is the same as R of the angle inverse of phi 1 after R of the angle inverse of phi 2. And hence, this is a, um, and this angle inverse I only need in order to represent the elements from some chart. This is just more complicated on groups. Um, but if you think about it, you'll see this is very simple. Okay, so um, we have a representation of S of the group, I'm sorry, it should be a capital SO. Well, I treated it like that, but it's a capital. Have a representation of this group 
on R2. And this is usually how you first meet it, but it's a representation of this, of this Lie group. Okay? And um, there's another important example, and that answers again the question, are there any, um, are there any non-trivial representations of a Lie group? And you can define the following. Um, you can construct the adjoint representation, but you say, hang on, the adjoint representation that was something on the Lie, Lie algebra, we're now on the Lie group, and if you're on the Lie group, the adjoint representation is something different, and one usually writes it with a capital A, whereas the adjoint representation on the algebra is written with a small a. They have the same name because they're related, uh, but this is a priori different thing. This capital adjoint is a capital representation on the capital group <laughs> rather than uh, the small adjoint being a little row uh, on, on a little algebra. <laughs> okay, so construct the adjoint representation that goes in two steps. So first you define uh, the adjoint uh, map uh, that goes by the name capital ad sub g. Now the g is not a Lie algebra element, but the g here uh, is an element of the Lie group. What is a g? A g eats an element in the group and spits out an element in the group. Obviously there's no linearity of any kind here. And, um, and how is it defined? Well, it's defined that add g acting on some element h of the group is defined as g h g inverse. And what is between these objects, of course, there is the blob, the group operation. Now this seems a little extravagant, this kind of definition, but you can nonetheless make it. It's not a left translation, it's a left translation with L and the right translation with uh, G inverse, uh, one after the other, okay? So, um, okay, so, yeah, okay, anyway, I said it. Um, that's the adjoint map, and the adjoint map has one fantastic property, namely note, that the adjoint map um, acting on the identity yields G E G inverse leads G G inverse yields the identity. So the adjoint map keeps the identity where it is. Why is this great? Uh, interesting, since if we consider the push forward, consider the push forward of this adjoint map, so you have the add g with respect to a group element, and of this map you consider the push forward. What does that do? Well, you consider it at a point, and it goes from a tangent space of the group at a certain point, and I like to choose the identity, why? Because that is where our Lie algebra lies, okay? It goes into the tangent space at another point, namely at the point add g of e. You remember? The push forward takes you to the tangent space in the image, but at the point where the map acted on that base point here. Aha, but I just showed you that this is the identity again in case of the adjoint map. So what does that mean? The adjoint map, defined this way, has a push forward that is a linear map by construction between the tangent space at the identity to the tangent space at the identity. Ah, we know that guy. That is the Lie algebra of G. Well, it's at least isomorphic to the Lie algebra on G. Okay? That's the tangent space at the identity. And that means we have here a map that takes you to this add g, if we provide the g is a map from g to g. Hence, I can look at add, and add is without the g down here, and add takes you from g to the gl on what vector space? Well, on the vector space at the, the Lie algebra of G, so I can write it as TEG, 
okay, where uh, the G is mapped to the add sub G, because add sub G, uh, oh, to the add push forward, add G push forward, because that guy lies here. Well, you have to show that it's invertible, uh, but that's not so difficult because this guy is invertible. Obviously, it's add G inverse is the inverse of this, and obviously, so you can go back here as well. So, hence this is true, and what did I show by this? I showed that there is a map that takes you from the group into the general linear group over the Lie algebra. In other words, you can always find a representation of a Lie group on the vector space V given by the Lie algebra. So you could find a representation of the Lie algebra on the Lie algebra, but you can also find a representation of the Lie group on the Lie algebra, a Lie group representation. And that is why this is also called the add, the add G. Uh, this is, again, if you have no fantasy, if you just are handed a, a Lie group and you know about the Lie algebra, you know, oh, with a group, I always have a vector space that comes with it, the Lie algebra, the vector space underlying the Lie algebra. Um, you can say, okay, why not try to find a representation that represents the group exactly on that vector space that comes with it? And uh, the map that does that is this add map here. That's the adjoint representation of the Lie group. All right, so um, are there any questions so far? Okay, fine. So we discussed the representations of finite dimensional Lie algebras. We discussed the representations of finite dimensional Lie groups. And next time, finally, we'll come to the point, so we now we're down there on the Lie algebra level for quite a while. How do we get, go back from the Lie algebra level back up to the group? And can we hit the entire group? The answer is generally no, okay? Um, but there are kind of some interesting um, facts that one uses very often in this going up, and this going up is called the exponential map. Uh, it's a concept from differential geometry, but in, uh, uh, on Lie groups, these uh, exponential maps have uh, very nice properties, uh, even nicer than they, are, they have on, on normal uh, smooth manifolds, and we'll study them next time. Thank you.